Yesterday, Seiroji began to speak about the practice in accordance with the texts. As, as the Buddha taught, as instructed by the late most venerable Mahasi Sera. And what Seiraoji started to teach is in accordance with both the scriptures and practice. So today Seiraoji will continue to talk about this. First of all, the yogis need to know the method of practice thoroughly. If one doesn't know the method, then one won't be able to work. So one also must know thoroughly. And then having a basis in moral conduct, one who wants to develop a human mentality and to develop special human knowledge just needs to make effort the practice of satipatthana is high-level work. We should have faith in the benefits that it brings and a desire to attain the benefits. But desire to attain the benefits is not enough. One has to also apply effort, courageous effort, virya, always. Always during the practice one needs to apply effort. And if one can't do this, then in one month of practice or two months of practice, however many months of practice, one won't uh, gain the essence of the Dhamma. So uh, when Sayadawji looks at some of the yogis, uh, he sees that they're applying themselves and, uh, and within a week, one can start to experience um, the special qualities of the Dhamma. A normal person in one to two weeks with applying the practice steadfastly. And when one continues to practice, then one, uh, when one's energy develops, one no longer has to be encouraged to practice one has one's own momentum. But for this to develop, especially at the start, one needs to make a lot of effort. One needs to put in a lot of effort to develop this momentum. And some yogis, when Sayadawji looks at them, they do not look like yogis at all. They let their arms move around uh, they look around here and there. They don't restrain their eyes. They uh, do various things with their hands while they're walking. And this is not like a yogi, not at all. And if people practice like this without any respect for the practice, then there's no, uh, it's not likely that they're going to gain anything out of practicing. So one has to, um, one should have the mind that cherishes this practice and cherishes the benefits that come with it. In the world at large, among the dhammas which give us trouble, the most basic is ignorance, that is not knowing. And not just not knowing, it's also knowing incorrectly. An analogy is an eye, when it has a cataract, can't see correctly. If someone with a cataract sees, they don't see clearly, they don't see correctly. Ignorance, or avijja, covers the mind and then the mind doesn't know. So this is the worst of the kilesas because it creates darkness, a deep darkness. And in deep darkness, one can't see. It's also like a cataract. So this ignorance is the worst. 
And in the Buddha's time, there was a Brahmin, a wise Brahmin, who left the world and became a hermit. And he had a number of disciples who followed him. And each of them had a thousand disciples. They practiced the worldly absorptions, jhanas. And at one time, this head of the the leader of these hermits heard the news that a Buddha had appeared in the world and he wanted to see the Buddha. But as the leader of all these hermits, it was not easy for him to go. So he decided to rely upon his disciples. And he had a meeting of all his disciples and he said, there's a Buddha that has appeared in the world. Go and investigate, find out, is this true or not? Is he really a Buddha? And they asked him, O teacher, how will we know? And the teacher said, if you ask him a question with your mind, he will answer you verbally. Although you ask, you don't speak the question, he will answer you by speaking. So the teacher said, ask him these two questions. What is the head? That's the first question. And the second question is, what is cutting off the head? Ask him this, these two questions with your mind. And if he answers you by speaking, then decide for yourselves, is he a Buddha or not? So among the students, the leader of of them went to the Buddha, finally met the Buddha, and then asked in his mind only, what is the head? What is cutting off the head? And the Buddha answered these two questions. How the Buddha replied, in short, is avijja, not knowing, knowing wrongly, not knowing the true Dhamma, knowing it in the wrong way. This is the head. Throughout samsara, samsara, that is, mind and matter occurring continuously, this is like the head. Cutting off the head is knowledge. When knowledge arises, ignorance is gone. Ignorance is dispelled. Just as when light comes in, darkness is dispelled, so too knowledge arises and cuts off the head. So knowledge arising is cutting off the head, knowing the true Dhamma. And knowledge is not alone. Knowledge has causes for arising, both near causes and far causes. And the nearest cause is to focus the mind with concentration on the true Dhamma. So samadhi, concentration, focused mind, that is the nearest cause for knowledge to arise. And that means that only, only when samadhi is present, only when concentration is present, will knowledge arise. For samadhi to arise, the mind has to stick to the arising object with with sati. The mind has to stick to the arising object, and sati is what makes the mind do that. Sati makes the mind secure so that kilesas, mental defilements, can't come in and then the mind falls collectively on the object. 
In order for sati to stick to the object, one has to apply effort to get the mind to the object. One needs courageous effort to observe the object right when it arises, to push the mind so that it can reach the object. Virya causes sati to arise. For virya to be there, there should be a desire, chanda. Desire to observe the object, desire to develop knowledge, desire to gain happiness. For chanda, or zeal, to arise, one should have faith in the task. If one knows how much benefit comes with this, that one can cut off the head of ignorance with this practice, one should have faith that this, this, that this is a very good thing to do, to cut off the head of ignorance. So only if one has faith will chanda or desire arise. And then with the desire to get the results of the practice, one will make effort to observe the object. Making effort, sati sticks to the object. Sati sticks to the object, concentration arises, the mind is collected on the object and then knowledge can arise. This is cutting off the head. So faith, zeal, or chanda, sati, samadhi, panya. And with that one can cut off the cycles, which Sayadaji will talk about later. Regarding faith, at the start of the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha declared the benefits of the practice. The first of them is purity of mind. Kilesas, mental defilements, are distanced by the practice. That means the mind becomes free of extreme greed, free of extreme anger, free of extreme delusion. How good this is! And there are other benefits, too, besides purity of mind. The overcoming of suffering, the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, pain, grief, despair, physical suffering, mental distress. And one can gain a path, fruition, and knowledge. So... With this practice, we can eliminate all the things which give us trouble. And this is very simple and good. Just if there were only one benefit, if only mental purity were the, were the only thing that we gained, that would be very good. Because the mind, when it is impure, is foul. When the mind is clean, then one can have a truly human mentality, a human heart, and one can develop special knowledge. So one should know the benefits of satipatthana practice, either by hearing about them, reading, or discussing. And then faith will arise. With faith, there will be keen desire to get the results With desire to get what the practice brings, one will make the appropriate effort. With effort, sati will arise. With sati, there will be samadhi. And with samadhi, eventually, knowledge will come. This is cutting off the head. Among the parts of the body, the head is the most important. Because if the other parts of the body the other limbs are cut off or broken, they can be replaced. Even the heart can be replaced. But the head can't be replaced. Cut it off and that's the end. As long as the head is there, the body can live. 
Therefore, the head is the most important for life. So ignorance, not knowing, <coughs> is the head of the aggregates. So not knowing, like with a cataract, this ignorance sees wrongly. Ignorance is a mental quality, so it knows in a way, because it's mental, but it knows wrongly. And if we are to say completely what this avijja, not knowing, is, it's not knowing the true Dhamma or knowing it wrongly. So what is the true Dhamma that, the, that avijja, ignorance, doesn't know? It doesn't know the truth of suffering, dukkha sacha. It doesn't know the truth of the cause of suffering, samudhya sacha. It doesn't know the truth of the end of suffering, nirodha sacha. It doesn't know the truth of the path to reach the end of suffering, maga sacha. These four truths are to be known, to be dispelled, to be realized, to be developed. The truth of suffering is to be known. The truth of its cause is to be dispelled. The truth of the end of suffering is to be realized. The truth of the path to the end of suffering is to be developed. Avijja doesn't know these four things. The four noble truths, dukkha, the truth of suffering, samudhya, the, the truth of the cause of suffering, nirodha, the truth of nirodha sacha, the truth of cessation of suffering, maga sacha, the truth of the path to cessation. So these four kinds of truths. First of all, one has to hear about these from the teacher. This is called ogaha. One has to learn in a general, general way. And if one doesn't yet know, then one discusses. So one hears about it from the teacher, and then further there's discussion, paripocha. And teaching here follows this model, because Sayadaji gives Dhamma talks, and then when the yogis meet with the teachers, there's the opportunity for discussion, to present your findings and to hear back from the teacher. So we have both of these, ogaha and paripocha, learning, listening, and discussion. So whatever mind and matter occurs, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, bending, stretching, lifting, moving, placing, there are all sorts of mind and matter that occur in the body. So basically, whatever seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, whatever nama and rupa, whatever mind and matter happens in us is the truth of suffering. And taking pleasure in this, thinking that this is good, and therefore craving it, is the truth of the cause of suffering, samudhya sacha. It's good. And so there's wanting to see good things, wanting to hear good things, wanting to smell, taste, touch good things. That's the truth of suffering. There's also wanting better and better things. That too is the truth of suffering. Then there's the wanting that is only satisfied if one, if one gets what one wants. That too. So craving and clinging, this is the truth of suffering. 
Yesterday, Sieroji started to explain what happens at the moment of hearing. There's the ear and the sound. These are physical, rupa. Then there's hearing consciousness, knowing the sound. Contact, the mind and the object meeting, and the feeling. These are mental. So learning about this is ogaha. Sieroji spoke about this. And then, if one, if this isn't clear, then one asks, which is paripocha. So how do we know these? We note hearing, hearing, at the moment hearing happens. We apply effort. And with effort, sati arises. And in the same in the same way, at the moment of seeing, there's the eye base, the eye capable of seeing, and then there's the visible object. There's also seeing consciousness, contact and feeling. So in seeing too, there's matter and mind, rupa and nama, occurring in a pair. So one has to learn about this. One has to understand about this. In the moment of smelling, there's the nose and the smell. Inside the nose, there's... The nose has a capacity to capture smell. And when there's something that is smellable, a fragrance or another odor, that comes on the air, it enters into the nose and then smelling occurs. So we know the smelling and then there's also contact and feeling, the meeting of the mind with the object and the feeling good or bad. So in this, there's nama and rupa, mind and matter occurring in a pair. To learn about this is ogaha, In taste, experiencing a taste, it's the same. When there's a tasteful object on the tongue, when we chew food and we come to know the taste, there are six kinds of tastes that we can know. Sweet, sour, hot, salty, bland, bitter. And... When we eat, the tasteable object comes in contact with the tongue and one knows the taste. So there's taste consciousness, contact, and feeling. In knowing taste, there's mind and matter. And in the whole body, throughout the whole body, wherever there's moisture, in all those areas, the earth element, patavidatu, the air element, vayodatu, the element of temperature, tejodatu. These three make up what is tangible. And tangible objects strike the body base all over. So when there's, when we're aware of stiffness, when there's a the stiff quality touches the impinges on the body, then we know stiffness. When there's tension, we know tension. When there's hardness, heat, cold, and so on, one of these becomes predominant and then we know them. So in touch too, there's the body base, the tangible object, and then there's the touch consciousness contact and feeling. In thinking too, Westerners usually think that the thinking happens in the head, but according to the monks, the thinking happens in the heart. That's the base for the mind. And it's not... um, 
touching something directly, not contacting something directly when we're aware of something in the mind, but it's imagining our mind turns to something and it's as though we see, as though we hear, smell, taste, touch. That happens in the mind. That is by the mind contacting that mental object. So whenever rupa and nama, mind and matter, occur in us, this is the truth of suffering, dukkha, satcha. And this is to be known. So how do we know it? We know it as soon, we note, we know by observing as soon as these things arise. And hearing about this method, this is the method, hearing about it is savana. And then there's application of the method, samasana. One observes so that the mind connects with the object as though it's rubbing against the object. If we do this, then we will know either softness, tension, hardness. We'll come in contact with the object and we will know it for the way it really is. And this is pativeda, knowing. So all this is relevant to the task. We have to hear about the method that is involves ogaha and paripocha, learn hearing and discussion. And then there's application, uh, taking it taking it in, applying it, and knowing coming to realization. So when we know true nature, then craving is, has no chance to arise. It is dispelled. And when we observe like this, the nama and rupa that happen in the moment, it's like preventive medicine. It's not that we cure it after it happens. It's, it's that we don't give the craving a chance to arise. With sati, or observation, because of this, um, then there's no opportunity to take pleasure in what is happening, and therefore uh, there's no craving. So one has to know the truth of suffering and to dispel its cause. And this is how, this is the method for dispelling craving or tanha. If one doesn't know the benefits of observing as we are now, if, if one doesn't, if one knows the benefits but doesn't have any faith in them, if one has faith but no desire to get the benefits, then one won't make effort And without effort, no sati will arise, no samadhi, no knowledge. Knowing the benefits that come from the practice, one should have faith in them and then the desire to get the benefits. And if one applies effort, then one will come to know what is really there as it is. Knowing Ignorance has no chance to arise. This is cutting off the head. When we know truly, when we know what is really there as it is, then knowing in the wrong way is dispelled. So it's said not knowing, not knowing, kilesas come in. Not knowing one clings. And sometimes, from time to time also, anger arises, dosa. So when one doesn't know, when one doesn't observe, then kilesas come in. But knowing and observing, then kilesas don't have a chance to arise. Kilesas are eliminated. So then, with knowing and observation, 
There won't be any ignorance and there won't be any taking pleasure in things. And these two are the most important to eliminate. So this is what happens on a part-time basis as one observes the object of observation then this one observes this bit of the truth of suffering that arises and when one observes then one knows the truth of suffering that is there and therefore the craving that would have arisen if we didn't observe doesn't have a chance to arise and in one minute of observation if one observes every second then there will be 60 moments in a minute of observation in five minutes there will be 360 of this observing mind arising this is the bhavana mind this mind is clean we create this mind, develop it, make it multiply, increase it. So the first two truths, the truth of suffering, the truth of its cause, are the worldly truths. And this is what we work with in the practice. The third and fourth truths haven't occurred in our being yet. So we can't realize them. We can't develop them yet. So we leave these aside and for the moment what we have to understand is that these are very good, the third and the fourth noble truth. And what we have to do is to try, uh, in order to, we, what we have to do is to try and know the truth of suffering. So, not knowing the Four Noble Truths, this is avijja, this is like the head. And knowing is cutting off the head, knowing. So for this knowing of the truth of suffering to happen, one needs faith, one needs desire, one needs to make effort, one needs sati and samadhi. And if one has these initially, if one works with these, then knowledge will arise. Without these to begin with, without establishing these qualities, faith, desire, effort, sati, samadhi, then knowledge will not arise. And what one knows will simply be imagination. Just, just what one is thinking about. So this is not true knowledge. And if one wastes one's time with just thinking about things, reflecting, one won't gain true knowledge. In one minute of thinking about stuff, then that's 60 seconds at which one is losing effort, sati, samadhi, and panya. So don't let this happen. So you have to, when thinking or reflecting arises, one has to observe and dispel it, note it and dispel it. This practice is, um, the benefits of the practice cannot be gained by reflection. If someone tells you that, and about the sweet, cold taste of an apple, or if you read about it, are you going to know about this sweet, cold taste of the apple? You can't know it by looking at the apple or by reading something about the apple. You have to put the apple in your mouth and chew it in order to know that it's sweet and cold. The Dhamma is the same way. You can hear about or read about this is Nama, this is mental, this is Rupa, this is matter. 
but you won't know these things just by reading or, or hearing about them. Only if you observe what arises ever new in your experience will you know what is Nama and what is Rupa. So just like one has to put the apple in one's mouth, one has to observe at the moment of arising whatever happens. And if one ex applies oneself to observation of the newly arising object every second of the time, every moment while one is awake, applying effort and aiming to observe the arising object, then one will cut off the head of ignorance.